it as much as I did. Um, I think there's an absolutely masterful piece of filmmaking. It was, uh, you could hear nothing, not a pin drop. Um, it was very gripping from beginning to end. And uh, it's a complete tour de force, I think. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start off by saying, for those of you that may not have known, that this is actually, we've just seen a 35 millimeter print of the film, is that, is that right? Uh, it is, yeah, I didn't know until today actually, but um, thanks to the producer, Chris Simon, we got a 35 mil print, which, was, which is a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a treat these days, seeing as everything's projected digitally and uh, shot digitally, and that was shot on film and projected on film, so that was yeah, quite I a treat. I understand it's the first time in six months they've actually projected film here, so. Um, and it's a not a scratch, not a speck of dust, a pristine, pristine print. Um, and as we can see, you shot it on Fuji. Um, and it had a certain, um, a definite look to it. So I just wondered if you can tell us a bit more about why you chose to shoot it on Fuji. Um, I just felt, uh, there's a, out of all the films I've shot, this one was definitely a Fuji film. And, and I obviously I knew that we were going to be, we shot this in uh, February and March of last year. And uh, my recollection of February and March in this country, as you all know, is it's pretty miserable. And the sun didn't come out once in six weeks, which was perfect for me. Um, until we got to Hamburg and then the sun came out, but it didn't matter because we did the, all the studio stuff. So... Um, it just suits the project. It's always a question of finding what suits the project, um, uh, uh, whether it be the film stock, uh, whether it be how you light it or the locations. It's everything about what suits the film. Yeah, it, it definitely had a certain colour palette. There was a certain amount of cyan in there. And was that something that you, you sort of um, factored in to have it that look? Um, I think so. I mean, obviously, a lot of it is the, the relationship with the production designer, um, Tom Burton, who is here tonight, actually. Oh, he's left. There he is. He hasn't left yet. Um, uh, Tom, who I'd had worked with before um, and was on the project before me, as is normal. So, uh, and, and Tom and I's um, aesthetic is very similar, so that was a great thing. And uh, my guess is it was trying to be subtle. It's not trying to bash you over the head because the performances don't bash you over the head either. So, it's important to be very subtle. There are obviously colour schemes in it, the red of um, Charlotte's dress and um, her lips and stuff like that. They, they guide you through the story because it's not, um, it's not a Hollywood... It doesn't have a Hollywood script structure to it. It doesn't... Um, at page 25, you don't have this... It doesn't whack you across the head. This is what the story is. And... And, and uh, you know, Hollywood allows you then another 25 minutes or half an hour to, to bring you into the story. This slowly drags you in. Um, and, and the end, it almost catches you up. Um, it's, it's, it's just much more of a French film than it is a normal uh, yeah, Hollywood-type structure. Yes, I'd agree with you there. And, and it must have been um, no mean feat to uh, actually work with uh, Charlotte, who's a woman of a certain age, and make her look as, as good as you, you did? I mean, was that a challenge? Um, it, it would have been a challenge if, if Charlotte Rampling hadn't have been one of the easiest and nicest people I've ever worked with. Um, she didn't fuss, and uh, so I tried not to. Um, and she, she was just a very accommodating person. But then again, you know, Gabriel Byrne is exactly the same age, so I had to look after Gabriel as well. Um, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and uh, I must admit, I even now I, I haven't seen that for about six months, and um, I think even sometimes I, I, I worry that I got too close because I operate the camera on everything I do as well. So w it, it's some of that decisions about you know the directors there all the time and telling you you know discussing how close you should be, and the, but I always end up getting really close because I, I just like to see the details of the characters' faces. Um, <coughs> But maybe I didn't get too close. I think that uh, I think she looks great, and I think that it's really she because she's you know a very she's a great actress who can just play. She doesn't play anything big, um, so you can just watch her. Um, and uh, I I don't I haven't spoken to Charlotte since I finished the film, so I hope she liked it. Um, and she hasn't. I haven't had any 
missed calls from Charlotte Lamping yet. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm sure she'll be delighted. So, um, had you worked with Barnaby, the director, before? Uh, no. Oh, so that's a, 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 a one No, we'd have gotten very well, but I hadn't worked with Barnaby at all. So, it, it has such a strong look to it, and as you say, you did your own operating. Uh, is that something you do on all your films? Um, it has been, yeah. I've, I've done it. I've operated on everything um, that I've done. I mean, I always said that... Uh, <coughs> that's probably where the light's just gone out. I look much better now. That's don't a relief. I <laughs> you don't have to have it on if we you We can want. see you now. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Uh, oh, operating, yeah. Um, I've always loved operating, and I, I always said that... Uh, um, I'll operate everything I do until I get offered a $100 million movie where they tell me I can't operate, but uh, and but I haven't been offered the $100 million movie yet, so I better still operate. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you've actually been really, really busy, particularly in the last two or three years. Mm. Um, so the fact that you operate on your own films as well is, is no mean feat. Um, do you find it easier to uh, sort of maintain control if you do everything rather than working with with other operators? I mean, I do because I came up through commercials where we we operate everything anyway. But um, it depends on the film. The film I did just before this, my with Marilyn, was a two camera shoot, so that was um, working with two cameras is obviously a completely different discipline. But I operated a camera on that. But this was just a one camera shoot. So it made sense for me to do it. I think sometimes, I mean, I do love the operators that come in and, and help me out, obviously, if I'm doing two cameras. Um, and I've always got an all, a huge amount of quality. I've, I've had a huge amount of respect for them. But um, I do find that if you spend, you know, six weeks talking to a director about how you want to frame it, how you want to compose it, how you want to, how you want to tell the story that when it comes to shooting, it kind of makes sense that you carry on. And it's not... I think if we had more time to shoot the films, I probably would step back, maybe. Um, but the schedules are so short that um, it helps that I just... Um, I can just do it myself, I think. Um, yeah, but uh, you achieved such a strong look to it by being able to do that and and the fantastic framing and, and the, the choice or the decision to shoot it 235 rather than 185 for such a, what is quite an intimate story. Um, was that your choice or a joint decision? Um, well, it was a joint decision, but it was also kind of, because we shot, it's a little bit of technology here, it's shot on two perforations, it's not shot on, a lot of films are shot three perf. So it kind of forces you to shoot in that ratio, otherwise, because the negative's a little bit smaller. So, so you hit. What's nice about it is you see a hint of grain in the film, um, which you wouldn't normally see on thirty-five mil, especially when you if you blew it up to a screen twice, three times the size of this, you'd start to see the grain, which, but it, which is nice because that's the one thing that you're missing from uh, films that are shot digitally these days. So, um, I think that. The 235, the letterbox format, can be can be a little bit tricky, especially when you've got two people talking to each other, cause just because it will, but then it has huge benefits for a lot of, you know, a lot of general filming. Uh, but it does sometimes force you to get very close. Yes, what you were saying, that it, the close-ups were yeah. close-ups. Yeah. And that whole opening section, where it was extremely close, and there was very... Um, obvious choice of where you put the focus. There was a certain amount of it that was out of focus completely, um, which a lot of the time you go, oh, that's no good. But um, it, it didn't detract from from what you were doing. It actually really, all that camera work and where you chose to put the focus was a, an important part of the storytelling. I think that, yeah, especially when you do that, there's, you kind of hope the, the uh, <coughs> you really hope the editor loves you because they can really m ruin your work if you're not careful. Luckily, Peter is a great editor, so there's always those moments where you go, "Yeah, that was that was in for that mo, just for that fraction of a second, just for that." That's kind of forces the editor's hand a little bit, um, especially if the shots are quite languid, um, which they are. And um <coughs> the real, the, the the truth of the matter is that when I originally started talking to Barnaby about the film. 
we were talking because Barnaby is about as French as, as, as any English person could ever be because he grew up in France. And uh, we were discussing French films, and I always said that I, one of my ambitions was to shoot a French film. Um, something that would probably never happen, since my knowledge of the French language is pretty poor. But uh, the last thing that we, when we wrapped the film, Barnaby came up to me and said, "Well, I think you've just shot your French film." Um, and I think it's true. It's as close as I'll ever get to a French film, anyway. I think. Uh, I think it, it certainly has a certain European flavour. And, and when the, the, the uh, credits came up, and he said Hamburg unit. I'm going, <laughs> well, Hamburg. How you know? Why do you go to Hamburg? I mean, was that because of the funding? Uh, I think it, it definitely was the funding. Yeah, um, I, I had a great week in Hamburg, but it was uh, we shot um, Charlotte Rampling's apartment in a Hamburg studio. So noth none of the exteriors are shot in Hamburg at all. So ninety percent of the film is is shot in and around London. And, and there's also an awful lot of it at night. So was that a particular challenge? Did you have to replace a lot of the practicals and things like that? How do you do that? Um, just normal, really. I tried to try not to. I tried to l not light as much of the film as I possibly could. Obviously, there is it is lit in certain places. That's for certain. Um, it suited the story as much of it as night as possible. I was trying not to make it look too London centric. Um, <coughs> Partly because we live here, so it, it, it it's quite it can get quite tricky to shoot London if you've just spent fifteen years shooting London. But um, uh, it, it it suited the story for it to, for a lot of it to be done at night. Um, I mean, one of my favourite shots in the film is is very early on when uh, Gabriel Byrne gets the call to go to the Barbican and um, he passes Charlotte Rampling sitting in the cafe, um, which which uh, uh, quite a few of us have shot in that cafe uh, uh, quite a lot because it's quite famous. It's in it's near um, St. Bart's Hospital. But that's definitely one of my favourite shots in the whole film. And that's hardly... That's just available light, really. It's just one light on Charlotte. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, the, uh, the t decision to shoot it on film as opposed to digital, I mean, were you put under any pressure to shoot it digitally? Um... I don't, we had maybe had a very short conversation. Um, I was lucky the director, Barnaby, was happy to shoot on film. And we made it work, really, with with the, the two perfs, because it does save you quite a lot of film. And it's such a great little format, and it's really... Um, I don't think it's that expensive to shoot. Um, and we had a great producer as well, who's sitting at the back, who allowed us to shoot on film. But without the... For a cinematographer, if the director and the producer aren't into it, you've really got an uphill struggle, that's for certain. So if you get those two on your side, um, you've, you've nearly cracked it, to be honest. And there's one other thing I wanted to ask you, was um, the scene where she kills Eddie Marson. How, how did you do that? Because there's a lot of blurriness, and it was a particular technique to do that. Um, uh, yeah, w um, it's difficult, because it was just a continue. it felt like a continuation from some some of the other scenes, I just got my little lens baby out, shoved it on the camera, and shot it at six frames a second, uh -huh. and then and then transferred it back at six, uh, which is a, a lovely technique because once you do that, you can't come back from it. Yeah, uh, you absolutely. have to. You've made that decision, but that that's part of the story that that um, she had from that moment of attacking him and running down the corridor. That's all, and then coming back and killing him. That's all done at six frames per second. So. Um, <coughs> Unlike digital, you wouldn't be able to come back from that. So if we had made, if we had cocked that up, that would have been a big. We would have been in big trouble. Well, I don't. I, th I think it's wonderful that you chose to do it in camera. It's very refreshing, and uh, I think that's the way films should be made. Um, personally, um, it's it gives a certain look that you can't achieve any other way. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 an old technique. I, I mean, I don't know when it. I, I mean, obviously, I saw it probably like a lot of people in, in the 80s on the odd music video here and there. But um, it's such a beautiful technique because um, it just gives you snippets of information, which is, which is to a certain extent what the film is doing anyway all the way through. It's just giving you just the amount of detail that you need to, get to, to, to finally get the story over without banging you over the head, without going... At 10 minutes th in, you need to know this. And at 25 minutes in, you need to know this. So therefore, the, now the characters can relax a little bit. It doesn't do that. It, it goes 
one through 60 minutes, you're still finding out the details about the characters. Um, and the cinematography and the opera and then the choice of shots has to has to replicate that or else you, you're kind of dead, really. Mm. So did you have any um, struggles getting all the gear up to the 19th floor? Uh, 19th. Um, uh, yeah, it was 20, I think it was floor 25, actually. Um, it was pretty high up. It we didn't have any, we didn't have any struggles getting up there, I don't think, but um, it's pretty, uh, I mean, the thing that did come to light quite early on in the film was that uh, Gabriel Byrne doesn't like heights, um, which we found out in that hotel room about four weeks earlier. Um, but his character was supposed to have vertigo, and then, so we were shooting that scene in the hotel, it was just me, Barnaby, and Gabriel. And uh, he, Gabriel just couldn't go near the window. It's a full-length window, so he just couldn't go anywhere near it. And so he was playing it really well because he was scared of heights. So that so they worried us a little bit because the end of the film, we obviously knew the end of the film, is, is Gabriel saving Charlotte off the balcony. And so we were worried for about four weeks about what was going to happen. <laughs> Because it's quite Did scary, that, that uh, balcony. I must Had he read that scene? <laughs> <laughs> I should imagine it was. So uh, presumably he had a body double to... Uh, Charlotte had a body double, yes. yeah. The, the shot from the other building is of a body double because you, you can, we, we, uh, nobody was prepared to let Charlotte stand on the ledge, uh, quite rightly. Um, and stunt people love doing that kind of stuff. But uh, Gabriel didn't have a stunt double. He just... Um, <laughs> he just uh, yeah. dragged himself out there. Poor man. Good for him. So, um, how long was the schedule? Ah, uh, Tom, how long was the schedule? Six, six weeks. So, what, 30, 30 days? Or 36 days? Uh, between 30 and 35, so I would 35, say. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, not quite six weeks. Yeah, great. Um, well, I don't know if anybody else, I'd like to open it up to the floor, see if anybody else got anything to that they'd like to ask a burning question. Oh, yes, there's a, over there. Yes, I did use a bit of stocks. Um, I, on this one, I don't think I did anything really with the film stocks at all because um, I shot with super speed, so I didn't really need to... I didn't need any extra light on occasions. It was just just enough. And, and also, the camera doesn't fly around all over the place, so sometimes when you're, when you're rushed, you know, you'd you'd maybe you might want to push to stop because you just haven't had enough light or whatever, but it was quite... It, it was quite considered. Everything we did was quite considered. There's only a, there's only there was a few occasions when we were really up against it, but it was generally inside, not outside. So um, there we did a little bit of um, extra shooting um, in the Barbican, but uh, no, I didn't. I just let the stock do its work. Anybody else? Go on. Go on, Tom Burton. Come on. You must Somebody's have something got to say. Something to say. <laughs> yes. Go on. That's a very good question. The, um, the answer could go on for a long time. Does anybody want to drink after this? Okay, the, the, the answer to that is, in its simplest form, and, and, and the, the person sitting next to me is, has been talking about this actually a bit longer than I have, actually. Um, it's still a big thing for me, for me yes, because cause I worry that it's going. And um, I've shot a lot of digital now and various different cameras. And... Um, at the end of the day, when I grew up watching films, like a lot of us in this room, that were all shot on film on 35 or 16. And uh, it's a very simple, it's not complicated. And when it's projected, it, look, it generally looks great. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to, to shoot anything, to be honest, but um, if, if there's an inkling of somebody giving me an option and it's right for the film, I'll go for it because, um, 
because the, 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 the other thing that worries me is the expertise of the people that are involved with film. They'll slow, slowly die away, um, not necessarily DPs, but projectionists and laboratory people and stuff like that. And I'm not sure that in 30 years' time, if, if they don't, we don't still have those people, then film will die because without Jerry the projectionist, wherever Jerry is, who projected this, you know, that's a huge amount of knowledge that that man has up there and, and how to... When I spoke to him this afternoon on the telephone and he was saying that, you know, you know, the sound was, a, you know, a little bit out, so he was going to play with the, some of the sprockets or something. I'm not quite sure what he said. I'm probably misquoting him, to be honest. But he was... That kind of knowledge is, is, is still amazes me now. And the people who process the film... And um, I think it's important to keep it alive, really, uh, in, in, in any way. It doesn't, have to, we don't, it doesn't have to be the main medium that we use by any stretch of the imagination. I'm happy to shoot digital. The only thing that worries me about digital is that I think a lot of projects are looking the same now. Um, and, that's, and that's a worry because... Sorry? Why? Uh, I think that a lot of that is down to the camera manufacturers. I think the people who make the cameras and everybody wants it's the, the, they want to line them up so there's not that much difference between them so they sell more cameras. I mean, I think there's a whole load more reasons, but I'm not sure the exact one. I mean, this this particular topic could go on for days. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Ben. It it would be such a pity if the skills associated with filmmaking with with film um, weren't kept alive. And the danger is that there's nobody coming along to actually learn those skills that, that the graders have known and, and the guys at the laboratory and the projectionists and even the, the film manufacturing. Um, if you don't invest in it, you can't keep making it better. Um, and it's also a case that, I don't know, is it 80% of cinemas in this country now now have digital projection? So and I think that's supposed to be 100% next year, isn't it? Yeah, something yeah. like that. So even f films originated on film end up being shown digitally, which is okay. But, you know, we, we were treated tonight to a proper film printed on celluloid and projected at 24 frames a second, um, which you don't get normally. Uh, I kept looking at the edges of the screen going, oh, is it, is it going to be jumping up and down? Because that's what you associate with old films. Mm. And, and every film you see, you think, oh, maybe there's a bit of you know, play in the, um, in the uh, perfs. But it wasn't. There wasn't. It was rock mm. steady. Um, and we just get so seduced by going to a cinema and seeing an image that is so perfectly flat and still that it loses it's um, organic nature to a certain extent. And I, I'll go on a bit more about this because I work a lot with um, young filmmakers and students. And I'm always astonished that they're all desperate to shoot on film because they've been brought up with the digital media and film to them is, is not just a novelty, but it's a way to learn their craft. Um, so... I think it's great that people like Ben, who, who is the, this generation of um, cinematographers, is keeping it alive. I mean, it's, it's really a question of choice, because we, we, we just still want to be able to have the choice. Um, yes, that's Tony, isn't it? Yeah, the DI is done. Um, uh, I think Chris, will, the producer, will be able to answer that. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yes, there's another question. 
Uh, yeah, we used, um, <coughs> because I wanted to go two perf, um, I used uh, an Arton um, Penelope. I don't know why they called it Pen the Penelope. It's quite a new chem, French chem, of course. Um, which helped me feel my way into the French way well, of the Penelope moving. Is that specially designed as a two perf camera? Yeah, it does two or, two or three. Um, it's great, beautiful little camera, and it was provided by Take Two, who have provided the drinks this evening. Oh, fantastic. <coughs> oh, there's another hand. Oh, and, oh, just, was gone one more oh sorry, lenses. Sorry. Uh, we use Zeiss super speeds because they're fast and small, and Ingenue zooms because they're French. And there's another question back there. Uh, the lift scene was the only other scene that we shot in Hamburg, apart from the interior of Charlotte's apartment. Um, we, it's a, it was a beautiful building, um, and it, it was it had a, a staircase and the lift right in the middle of it, obviously. But there's a, there was a whole lot of space around the um, lift that if you're a director or cameraman, as soon as we saw it, we went, there's no reason why we can't just put the... We just rigged the camera to the side of the lift, which had glass all the way around, and um, let it go. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, good, um, good uh, observation. Yeah, there's a great sort of the way you split the frame up and into sections and some of it was in focus, some of it was out of focus. It was continually sort of your eye was always scanning the frame to see what was going on and but always directed where it should be looking. Thank you. Um, that's also another, uh, uh, watching it again, uh, you realise that that's a film for cinema because uh, there's... It's very difficult to do that on television, I think, because there's a few clues that if you miss them, you're in, in with that film. I think you're kind of in trouble earlier on. You, I mean, it would take you could get them later, but the toothbrush in the um, in the glass. I think on television you may miss that because it's quite it's quite small. You may have missed it anyway, but um, but you get it later. Um, just harking back to your previous work, this is so different from. My route with Marilyn. With, did you approach it with a completely fresh mind? I did. Well, it, uh, strangely, I shot. We shot. I shot this straight after My Route with Marilyn, which was a very different film. It was much more like a Hollywood studio picture, much more conventional storylines, much more, f much more of a three act structure. Whereas this doesn't have that kind of structure. So, um, and it's funny because as soon as I finished Marilyn, I, I, I said to my agent. I just quite like to do a slightly smaller independent film that was a bit more left field, and um, and we found this one, which was which was a great treat um, because it was very much different from the Marilyn film and a different kind of pressure, to be honest. It was, you know, it was it was much more of a pure filmmaking experience for me. And also, you've got Henry the Fourth. That's. On was it next week? It's on Saturday. Saturday. If any, any of you love Shakespeare? Um, you've got a treat coming on Saturday night. Uh, Henry the Fourth on BBC Two, the part one, and then if you love it, you can watch part two the following Saturday. Brilliant. Um, just before we we wind it up, any more any more questions? Oh yes. Um, that's a very good question, actually. With that kind of detail, we probably wouldn't discuss it beforehand um, because it's just filmmaking technique. Um, we d obviously discussed the style before, so you'd look at references or whatever and you say, I'd like that or you like that. But some of the details, we wouldn't. Um, I, I generally find that um, after take two, I start experimenting with, um, with those little details. Um, whether it be I, I, I'll start the, I'll start the shot someplace else and then come on to the character 
um, develop, just develop the shots from someplace else or then start playing with the focus because um, it's that kind of detail I've always found difficult to discuss beforehand. And it, it's such a small thing. You can do it on set. There's certain things you can't do on set at the last minute, like we like the set, and you wouldn't want to do that. But that kind of, that kind of um, intuitive camera work is really, is, is really done on the day, really, to be honest. Um, Uh, yeah, that's that's a key thing. Your, your preparation will be the will be the one thing that will save you. Um, if you understand the schedule and you understand the, um, exactly what the first assistant director was, wha whatever happens, you know, whatever things that are thrown at you, um, but, but certain things you want to leave until you've got the camera and the actors, because that's you know, you c it's very difficult to discuss those little moments before shooting, unless you're doing something which is much more cartoon or comic book, in which case you storyboarded. I mean, there's not, there wasn't obviously one storyboard for that film. So um, uh, it's just a question of finding the um, finding the detail in the shot. And then if you don't get it on the first take, try it on the second or the third or the fourth, because it only takes, you know, it may you may only do it once. And you sometimes you don't know if it's going to be the take that gets used. You would have no idea. So it's best to just give it a go. You know, or to ask the director for another take. And you obviously have a very good focus puller. <laughs> <laughs> I do, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, any more questions? There's one at the back. That's a very interesting question, but I'm going to hand that over to Tom Burton, the production designer. Uh, yes or no? To, yeah. the, to the second question. Yeah. That's a good. That's a great answer, Tom. The, I'll answer the. Uh, I'll answer the first question because that was very easy. Um, the shot of Charlotte in the park was a steady cam on a rickshaw. Ah. And did you operate the steady cam? I, I did a couple of steady cam shots in that film, and Jerry Fassbender did the big long one through the arcade. And I would just like to say. I have now retired from steady cam. <laughs> 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 I did half a picture. <laughs> yeah, more more than my life's worth. You've got to try it once. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, oh, there's another one. Uh, on this film, I, 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 it didn't bother me at all. We had a great, fantastic line producer, co-producer, Joe Byrne, uh, who was hugely experienced. Um, and we had a fantastic producer who just let us go, really. I, I quite like the fact that... Um, I quite like the smaller budget. As long as you can, you can get it done, I, it, it doesn't bother me. Because the thing about it is you do get a lot more freedom. I mean, it's difficult for me to say, because I, I haven't done anything over... 12 million dollars yet so um, 
but I, I'm kind of used to it, and I, I kind of like that. Um, I've heard, obviously, as we all have, horror stories of of people having, you know, huge amounts of uh, interference and not getting their um, their kind of vision or what they thought about it, which is hugely dispiriting for a director, much more so than the DP, because the director's been on it for years. Um, so on this, it didn't it didn't um, it didn't worry me so much, to be honest. Um, I, I just saw two great actors in front of me every day, and and if they weren't there, I had I had two other great actors. Or, um, so uh, I, I kind of I, I have much I'd love to have <coughs> a car pick me up every morning, and uh, um, <laughs> it's. <laughs> It doesn't matter, especially if you shoot in the middle of London, it's okay. Um, uh, I think that's just the nature of the filmmaking in, in this country, is that, uh, you know, we, we don't get particularly big budgets. I was at a, a lecture last night where we were talking about A Man for All Seasons, the Robert Shaw film, with, with, you know, which was shot th 40 years ago, and with, with a Hollywood director, uh, and, and that was apparently a tiny budget, and it looks massive, it looks huge. Um, but that's just part of filmmaking, I think. Yeah, it doesn't really matter how much money you have or haven't got. You're still going to have to do it in the time allotted, and so there's always going to be a certain amount of pressure. Um, it just so seems that budgets these days are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, that um, low budget 20 years ago is um, no longer low budget. So... That's the way things are going, and um, the more of us that can keep the art of cinematography alive, the better. Um, any other questions? Um, no, a clue. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I never ask. Well, I mean, I, I get an approximation, but because because you you kind of need to know what the budget is before you take on a film. Um, because you, you need to know whether you think you can get it done for that. It, it's not so much, it's not as, as important for a cinematographer as, as it is for a production designer, but, um, uh, you, but the thing is they only give you a ballpark figure. So, I mean, that's probably all you need, really, but, uh, um, you know, you, you find out pretty quickly within the first conversation with the line producer about whether, whether you think you can get it done um, for that. And um, that's the key conversation for the whole film, really. That, conversation with the line producer and, the, and then what comes out of that the, the conversation with the producer and and um and to be honest i got everything i wanted on this really we could have done with a couple more days maybe but that's it's usually time more than anything than, than more than the budget but obviously the budget is the time but um i was pretty well looked after yeah it seems to be that um production designers have to control their own budget whereas Cinematographers just ask for what they want, <laughs> and they're either told yes or no. <laughs> yeah, you, you wouldn't want to give me a budget. I'd probably spend it within the first two days. <laughs> um, any more? No. Nope. Or maybe we should all go and have a drink, and um, then you can find something else to talk about. <laughs>